All right. So we have our second year students today delivering us a talk on uh, what you call uh, analysis of the GPS and IMU sensor data collected based off of an experiment that they performed here on campus, which was about two weeks ago. So they're going to update us about uh, what they have tried out, what they have learned, and hopefully on what to take forward. Okay, so we we'll try to engage in a little bit of a discussion with them and try to see where they are and how it's going. So feel free to go through the presentation. So I don't know how you're doing it. I'm guessing a tag team presentation. Like we have certain parts which are the people. So one after the other, you will be talking about. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll present my screen and then. Okay. So in that case, just uh, whoever is the first presenter, just take it away. Oh uh, yes, sir. I'll share my screen. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. I can see your screen. Okay, I'll just go to the screen. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, welcome everyone. Today, me and my friends will be talking about the analysis of GPS and IMU sensor data, which we collected from the smartphone. And the mobile application was built by our mentor, Vishwabhaya. So uh, moving on, what we have done is, so what we basically had to do is we had the application ready and uh, we had to run the ROS uh, commands in our laptops and uh, the mobile from all the sensor data from our phone we used to transmit from the mobile to the laptops and then we used to and then we plotted the whatever gps and imu data we got into our screen to see how accurate the data we collected was so in total of we did total of six test runs out of which three were car two were cycle and one was walk and uh, this you can see in the screen that the three which were there for car one we did at the medium speed slow speed and the other one was a laptop closed so the one uh, which we did with slow speed was uh, because our normal boat speed will be kind of slow, not a, not a normal car speed. And therefore, sir drove it slower so that we can uh, get an idea about how accurate the GPS data will be when uh, we are actually using it uh, on a boat. So there were, these were the six test runs which we did. And these were the phones which we used because at the end, of course, we wanted to compare how the phones are performing. And of course, that depends on the... Uh, chip which is the phones are using so these are the list of the phones uh, which we use and the and their respective vendors and uh, as you can see like uh, based on analysis like oneplus not to perform the best and generally it used to give an imu data at around 60000 messages and gps around 1000 messages uh, so the frequency for oneplus not to was the best gps and imu both including and these are the respective uh, chip mem uh, vendor data now talking about the interesting part which is how does it work so uh, Vishwa we had created a ROS launch file so uh, an EKF file which is estimated Kalman filter so how does it work is so what we are going to do is we have GPS in our phone we have IME in our phone now why not we you know fuse both of those sensors and then estimate our position now why do we do that so for example uh, you have your GPS data and the GPS data's frequency is quite low. So you won't be getting like uh, a 10, 10 hertz or something uh, GPS frequency. You'll, you'll be getting like one signal per two seconds or three seconds, etc. So the GPS signal frequency is quite low. Plus, suppose you are under tree cover or uh, there is probably you are uh, going through a tunnel or something. So you will have some uh, signal blockage and you, won't, you will have a signal loss basically. So those are the main disadvantages of GPS. And the main advantage of the GPS is that it will, of course, give you the most accurate, uh, actually, uh, position based in the satellite mapping. So that's one advantage of GPS. And talking about IMU, IMU has six degrees of freedom. Namely, it can tell you the pitch roll here, which is rotation, acceleration, and your orientation. So uh, using the IMU, we can then estimate our, uh, uh, estimate our, we can predict the position which we are going based on a starting point. 
but the main disadvantage of IMU is that your boat or your car will of course be vibrating and it would be in constant motion and therefore uh, there will be a lot of noise in the IMU data for example our cycle the data reading which we took in our cycle went haywire because we had kept our phones in our pockets and of course uh, since we had kept our phone in our pockets the uh, like the phone was going up and down up and down and the IMU data was all uh, rigged so that's the case uh, the IMU plus GPS data integration so uh, what what's the speciality about this is that when we combine both of them, the disadvantages are removed totally. So it's like disadvantage, adding a disadvantage plus adding a disadvantage is kind of giving us an advantage. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, use IME data plus GPS data and then I'm going to correct like I'm going to write an algorithm which will correct the IME and GPS data to a certain extent to give me a accurate prediction of where my position is. So it's like having two sensors based together. So as you can see, this is the architecture of the Kalman filter uh, used. So the IME data, which is the gyroscope and acceleration trans is going through mathematical transformations. And then it is predicting the state prediction of where, where am I currently. And the GPS data, because it gives the coordinates directly, is directly going on to this uh, state over here. And we are then calculating the error and feeding it back. Uh, it's like a feedback mechanism. So we are feeding it back to the state prediction and then uh, we are like adjusting our parameters so that we get a more accurate uh, data to explain more about this let's actually take an example so uh, let's say we have the imu sensor input and these are the two coordinates xk and yk are the two coordinates and they will depend on the previous coordinate so this is like a continuous uh, bag of data and they depend on the previous coordinate so let's say this is some function axk minus one which means at time t minus k minus one this was my coordinate and these are some error functions which I can add. For example, it could be uh, error due to the loss of data or the noise which I'm adding. So these are the errors which I'm going to get in the IMU. Similarly for the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. And the and after those transformations, what I get is actually the X and the Y coordinate here. Similarly, in the GPS section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to input the GPS data. And since GPS is a little more accurate, I've, I haven't added much uh, noise here, but this gives us the X hat and Y hat uh, coordinates for the gps data now coming to the right side uh, for simplicity let us consider only the x data which is 1d position okay and we you know draw a probability distribution function for it for example like xk which is the, through the IME data we predict that this is the variance of where the actual uh, car or boat is located and from the gps data we get to know that this is somewhere around where the car should be located so what we do now is we multiply both those data to get this Kalman filtered position. And this is then fed back into the feedback error subtracted from the error to correct uh, the parameters or whatever we want for the car. So this gives us a rough estimate to multiply the probability distribution. Now what we use is known as estimated Kalman filter, uh, which Aditya will be explaining through the robot localization package. Over to you Aditya. One small correction, it's not estimated, it is extended Kalman filter. Yeah, sorry, extended. Very clear. Aditya, we are not able to hear you. Maybe you can try removing the microphone and so robot localization package is uh, basically a ROS package that is built to do uh, whatever Rishabh told right now. So, uh, like Rishabh explained what an actual Kalman filter is, but uh, we use a slight modification of that, which is called extended Kalman filter. There is This package also provides us another option, which is unscented Kalman filter, but that's not what we have used for this particular application. We have only used the EKF. Uh, so, our aim is basically to find the 3D position and the velocity of the robot at each time interval. So, 
uh, we can't use do this with just one sensor. So we have to use the data of multiple sensors. So suppose we have this IMU data. Uh, we can't get the exact location. And if we have this the GPS data, we can't get the velocity. And the time interval for the uh, time interval between the measurements will be too much. So uh, this package allows us to fuse the data from which we can infer more than uh, what is actually available. Uh, can you see the second photo clearly? Yes, I think we can see it. Yeah. Okay, so the aim is to get. This of just near the same. Yeah, sorry. So suppose we take uh, X as uh, the 15 dimensional state variable. So it will contain uh, information about our position, uh, orientation, angular velocities, uh, linear velocities, and uh, linear acceleration. So it will be a 15 dimensional state vector. Uh, and our sensors will more or less operate on this uh, vector space. So we can define a function, not function, but we can define H, which will be a sensor model, which we can apply for any sensor. Uh, and this will work on this X uh, vector space from which we can get our uh, readings, which we will call as Z. And uh, that K subscript just denotes the time at which we are taking this input. And this uh, VK is the measurement noise. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how we exactly get that uh, estimate, but that's what, uh, that's what the package uses. And uh, now we have to predict for the next instant of time because we need a continuous distribution we do not need discrete values so uh, if we know x k minus 1 which is our state variable which we need to measure we can apply a function f over it which is nothing but our newton equations uh, like force equations and torque equations and again add a process noise to it we can get for the next uh, this process noise is again assumed to be normally distributed, which again I'm not sure uh, why exactly. But this is how the packet actually calculates for the next instant. And uh, we also need an estimate error covariance and uh, measurement covariance. For for uh, getting these two, we need to find actually the Jacobian of our uh, Newtonian equation. So that small f, we have to find the Jacobian of that, which we we'll call capital F. And with that, we can get the uh, estimate error coordinates for the next instant. And there are three basic equations, uh, which is there in the left hand side. You can see. Uh, this is, these three equations are the main equations with which the package works. So the last one is the most important one where we can get the uh, estimated error coordinates. Again, these are some high level. I'm not exactly sure how they have derived these equations, but this is how the package does it. And the most important part of this is if we were to use a normal Kalman filter, then our uh, capital H, which is, it should have been an identity matrix because uh, it will not allow different sensors to give different types of data. It will expect all the sensors to give uh, all 15 variables. But since we are using this EKF, uh, it will actually we can we can make it into a m cross 15 matrix where m is the number of uh, variables the sensor measures and if we get, if we pass this h and uh, measurement covariance and this estimate covariance into our extended Kalman filter we will get the few simple data so this is how uh, the model is supposed to work Hello, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, right, sir. So, uh, me and uh, I, we did the part of uh, taking the uh, bag files and uh, taking the longitude, latitude, and IMU parts of the uh, bag file and then converting it into CSV files and then we plotted it. 
So, the, uh, so now basically we should go through a series of parts. Uh, this is uh, this is the first run which we did. This is the first run we did. Uh, we were in we were all in the car and uh, all of us almost got the same reading. So the car, the first run and the second run didn't make much of a difference. All of them, all of the four and uh, four uh, devices got almost the same readings, uh, which are next. Uh, yes. Uh, so and uh, in well, what happened in others' case was in uh, when me and uh, uh, in my device and in uh, in Bindusara's device uh, when we closed our laptop and we and when we when we went at a very high speed, the frequency was very low. It didn't uh, give messages as much. So two of our rounds uh, got wasted. So we went for two circuits. Uh, as you see here, the first uh, diagram here. We actually went two rounds with this, but both those rounds, the laptop was closed and uh, the speed was very high. We went a bit fast, so it didn't give uh, accurate data. So what we did was then uh, we installed another uh, software to keep the laptop alive and then we, we went at a relatively very lower speed. So we got somewhere around uh, 700 to 800 messages, all GPS messages. IMU gave a lot more messages, but the GPS messages were somewhere close to 800. So what we inferred from that is that um, at, if we go at very high speeds uh, for mobile sensors, uh, the uh, message the message frequency will not be so good. So when we have to look at higher speed, we'll obviously have to maybe look at a GPS module or something like that to have better uh, message frequency. And uh, in the walk file, uh, walk file, all of us got very accurate data uh, because we are we are relatively very slow. And uh, except for uh, uh, one uh, in one device, which up next. Yeah, so now this we plotted, there is a package called GM plot, so which uh, basically uh, plots the gra whatever graph we had on the in the Google Maps and uh, shows exactly where it is. So this part will be explained by Avish. Over to. Walk package, what package was this? Sir, uh, GM plot. GM plot, huh? Okay. Sir, it's a Python package. Okay. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you, Ayush. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, collecting the data from the CSV files, we used uh, GM plot. So, GM plot basically uh, has a public API inbuilt into it. So, when when we just uh, access that package, it automatically connects to Google Maps API for public development purposes. That is where you can see the watermark here. So, we can uh, we can only use it for our own uh, purpose. And uh, using this public API, we can uh, plot certain amounts of data on this uh, package. So using um, the CSV files, we plotted the data. For the walk test, uh, the phone sensor wasn't working properly during that time. So our test test was a little bit, uh, it didn't work that well. However, with Anirudh's phone, we got a very good estimate of how the path should be. And um, uh, well, bo both while going clockwise as well as going anti-clockwise, as we can see, it plotted a very accurate path. Uh, a similar, similar case for uh, Bindu Sara's phone as well as uh, Rishabh's phone. The, and as you can see, Bindu, Bindu Sara's, uh, Rishabh's and, and um, Anirudh's phone follow almost the same path. So that verifies whether um, the sensor was working properly and uh, capturing the correct GPS latitude and longitude. Uh, again, as you can see with the, the cycle test, um, the data we received was very erroneous and um, this is probably because the sensors were not working properly and they were completely out of alignment. And because of that, it started reading two, three coordinates uh, at the same time. And when we tried plotting it using a line plot, it started connecting those two lines also. This is which we can see a very basic kind of work. On the other, on the other hand, uh, Andirud's uh, test, um, we can see a almost uh, correct path as to what we had predicted before. Next slide. And same, similar is the case for uh, Bindu Sara's phone and Next slide. So we, in order to study these variations a little bit more, we, start, we tried to plot the longitude variation uh, with time for each of the runs. This is for the cycle test, as we found that to be the most interesting. As we can see in Aditya's uh, um, phone, as each at each time stamp, we can see 
if we draw a vertical line through the graph, we can see there are two longitudes which are measured. So that confirms the uh, sensor error which occurred. Uh, in other cases, we get an M shape. This is actually a very small change, but Matplotlib magnifies it a little, so it uh, looks quite uh, different. So this we can this happens due to the change in the terrain, and in case of a uh, shift, it might happen due to the um, the longitude or the altitude might change due to heaving of the uh, shift. So that might uh, affect the data a little, uh, a little bit. You guys think the longitude might change the heave of the vessel? What do you think? Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. It won't, sir. I think the longitude. Oh, sorry, sir. I meant uh, for altitude, the heave will change. Like, he will change the altitude. Uh, yeah. Not the longitude. Yeah. All right. Next slide. Uh, yes, sir. That's our presentation. Okay, that is the presentation. Good, good job. Vishwa, any comments? I think I saw Vishwa joining in. He uh, sent a message that his laptop has just hanged. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, any questions from our audience for our second year batch? Yeah, I, uh, I didn't quite understand a few aspects of the plots. Can you go back? Yeah, sure. I'll just share my Uh, which plot specifically? Yeah, uh, the first plot of the series. This one? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so this is the output from the robot localization of the extended Kalman filter node, right? Uh, no, this is, I think, uh, only the GPS data which we had. Uh, this is not the fusion oh. data. Yeah, here okay, we didn't is... uh, have the robot localization package while we did this. So this was just okay. the GPS uh, data. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, where did you fuse the IMU data? In which plot do we have it? IMU data we only fused in the cycle runs. Uh, one of the cycle runs, like uh, yeah. Uh, Chuck, could you uh, ah yeah here yeah. on the GM plot uh, we so you you see like two graphs here right so yes uh, so one set uh, shows the like like the the dots here basically are the GPS coordinates wherever it gave us coordinates so that's a scatter plot and uh, the continuation was uh, like assisted by that. Um, we like the blue line. Uh. Blue lines are of IMU and the red plots are of GPS. Oh, the blue line is the. What is the blue line? Can you repeat again? I lost you. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can't see the blue line. Uh, yeah, uh, like it's a bit. Oh, uh, oh, yes. so I'll just try and. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are not yeah. yeah, sir. So, like in no, in no plot have we actually fused the data. Uh, the GPS and no, 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 we have our code has only used the GPS data. Like we have only taken GM plots and we are plotting only the latitude distance. We are not it's actually using uh, This is just a line plot that, that actually lines the through the GPS plot. But uh, I believe Vishwa Vaya has done the fusion as well. So he was showing us yesterday or day before yesterday uh, the fused uh, plots itself. In none of our laptops, actually, the robot localization package we were able to install successfully. I think only in Rishabh's case it was done. And even then, we don't know exactly how to use it. So we have to look into that. And uh, also, like, we have to go for the test runs again as well, Rishabh. Yeah, like, hold the phones in the proper orientation. 
because the annual data is first time. So what was the problem and what repeat has what tests have to be given? Uh, the IMU, like we did not hold the phone in the proper orientation, right? So the IMU plus GPS fusion got rewired because of that. Because our phone was continuously moving up and down in our pockets, so we were holding it like in another orientation. So that we'll have to like hold it in a proper single orientation and take it again. And what is the problem if you hold it in different orientations? What does it do? The IMU data will continuously change, right? So suppose if I'm holding like this, it's calculating the x acceleration, but then I, you know, I just rotate it somehow, so it will then, uh, you know, point it in a different direction. Yeah. Even though I'm moving in another separate direction. So you can't make a consistent comparison. So like, uh, we can make that if uh, all of us are holding the phone in the same orientation, and uh, we all have to travel in the same like. We have to be at the, it is like almost in the same spot and with the same orientation. Like all of the phones should be pointing to the same direction, and we shouldn't shake it as much as possible. Uh, maybe then we might be getting consistent with it. There might still be some small errors, but uh, so how do you plan to achieve that in your next upcoming test? Make sure that that does not happen. But I am still. I am actually still doubtful about. Why we exactly have to have the same orientation? Because, like, uh, anyway, the rotation won't be considered when the data is getting fused. Right? So, only the uh, angular velocity will be important. So. Why won't it be fused? Why, why do you think that the rotation may not be important? I'm talking about this rotation. So, maybe this rotation will give something different. It might think we are turning and stuff. So, that might change. But if we all keep it, like even in the first one, approximately all of us kept it flat. We actually tried that, so I don't know how it will change once we again do it. Yeah, that, that is my point. Like clearly, it has made some effect for which Vishwa has asked you to uh, redo the test. Some, some, clearly, the data was not as clean as he expected it to be. That is why you are planning to do a rerun. The question is, if you do the same reason with the same uncertainty in the parameters, then we won't expect any better results out of the experiment. So we have to learn from our experience of the past, and we have to somewhat get better at it. That is the whole objective, right? So in that sense, how can we do it something better so that so the for, phones are not moving? So for cycle, we can have those uh, phone holder mounts. So that the phone will be stable. And for car, I think car I had kept it in the side panel. So mine, I think I am the GPS car data came out to be correct. If I remember what Vishwa was showing. And uh, for walking also, like we'll have to. Can we like uh, have a box and just stick the phone inside and like have a bingo? Now you are thinking. Now he has given you an idea. Hmm. Get a box which you put all four phones and then you hold the box and walk or you hold the box and cycle. Holding the box and cycling. <laughs> now put it on your carrier. Okay, we don't have a carrier. Uh, okay. Next time I will do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments for our second year? Uh, you showed one of the GPS plots that uh, didn't plot anything, like uh, it was just a dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It did not like the phone didn't like the computer went to suspend mode, so for only one second. Now you know how to correct for that, right? Yes, yes. yes. Because how to avoid the suspend mode, you now know about it. And in fact, you have educated me also about it. All right. Ah, hi, Vishwa. Uh, any other comments from your side for the second years? Uh, sir, I just joined in. I was having trouble joining to WebEx on my system. I missed most of the presentation, but uh, yeah, I had a call with them, so I gave them. Uh, the feedback or what 
needs to be done for uh, better results so what what are other uh, other tests that they need to perform in order to uh, Sir, I think uh, the one of the car tests came out to be really good, uh, but I think in that Adya's phone uh, stopped midway the second round. Uh, but otherwise, the car tests came out to be good. Adya showed him the car getting on. Other tests, I think uh, we have to repeat all the tests because in, there's no one test where you know all four of them has a proper data apart from the one test which I showed you. So. I think they'll have to do it again, and yeah, this time they know what went wrong. So yeah, that is the idea. We have to learn and get better experimenters as we progress further, right? Yes. Now, also, I wanted to kind of uh, understand. So, how much of this Talman filter stuff you actually guys understand, second year students? Okay. Not much, actually. Not much, right? Okay. So I can kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what is going on, but of course, the math and the other part of it, what you are putting there, will be covered much later uh, when you come into the new report. We kind of cover a little bit of that part and that part. Now, I think one of the questions that you ask, and I'm, I'm trying to pull this from memory, right? Uh, is that why is it assumed that the filter is or the noises are Gaussian in nature? Was one of the questions which some of you had doubts on, or at least some of you alluded to. The primary idea here is that in a Kalman filter, we are assuming that the system is linear, and when the input to the linear system is Gaussian distributed input. The output also will be a Gaussian distributed output, and that is the primary understanding behind the idea. And most noises which you will find, unless until they are biased noises in the experiments, will typically be represented by a Gaussian distribution. And more or less, you will find that that's a good enough distribution to carry. On. You may. Ah, that's a very good question. Usually, that information, which is your covariance matrix diagonal terms, which you are referring to, you do not measure them. That is something which your, uh, in, you know, what we call the sensor provider, generally gives you an uncertainty limit on. Okay. Sometimes they may not give a limit on you. Now, then the question becomes, how do I know? Right. Then the best way to do it is to collect, put the phone on a stationary position, see, leave it down there, collect the data from there, and see how that distribution is coming out. Plot that, make a statistical histogram plot of all the data that you collect. You'll get an uncertainty cone as to how far is the GPS away, how far is the IMU away. You'll find that typically the errors will be very very small in the IMU. Especially with respect to accelerations and gyroscopes, but with respect to yaw, yaw angle, you will see that it will drift quite a bit. Even though the phone is stationary, you will see that the yaw is actually drifting quite away. So the reason for that is pretty simple, because what it is doing, it's trying to see, no matter what your orientation of the craft is, where is the acceleration due to gravity vector point. Based off of that, it is trying to figure out what your new orientation is. So, if I have thing which is perfectly flat, then okay, my z-axis is pointing downward, but my x and y can be in any orientation, and my gravity vector will still be pointing down. Right? So, there is an ambiguity in the sense that where is x and where is y cannot be precisely be determined. If you are on a perfectly flat surface and if you perfectly don't have any noise, but then even pitch and roll should be uncertain, right? Sorry, even pitch and roll should be uncertain, right? Like pitch and roll will be little less uncertain because the moment you roll the vehicle or you pitch the vehicle, the gravity vector is no longer straight pointing down. But then how do we know like uh, why the gravity vector is not pointing down? Do you pitch or do you roll? 
Yes, so that is a good mathematics which is going on inside of it. That it is using the gyroscopes and using so the gyroscopes are measuring angular velocities of the body. So it is integrating the angular velocities in order to get the angle, and then it is using the gravity vector to correct for it. In addition, it is also using the magnetic compass to find out where the angle is on. So it is using a bunch of things together in order to come up with that angle estimate. So that angle estimate itself is an output of a so-called Kalman filter. But that Kalman filter is implemented right on the sensor chip. Okay? That is not something which you are implementing. What you are doing is I am taking that output out from the IMU, I am taking that output out from the GPS, putting them together, and then I want to see that where is my estimate of the path that I take. Usually because the accelerometer has a lot of sensitivity, very sensitive. Even if I shake the phone a little bit, you'll see large bumps come up, right? So when you try to double integrate that acceleration to get the position, you can imagine what is happening. I'm just adding noise, I'm integrating over the noise, right? So you need the GPS data to precisely correct for that position and in order to understand. So you remember you showed, you guys showed me a nice little plot Rishabh, can you go back to that slide where you had that uh, Kalman filters uh, probability distributions drawn out? Correct, right here. So you see that there is an uncertainty in the GPS data and an uncertainty in the IMU data. What you are trying to do is you want to combine them both and you want to get a better estimate than the worst sensor that you have. Okay. You want to kind of reduce your uncertainty. If I have zero uncertainty, that would essentially mean that that thing looks like a straight line rather than a bell curve, right? That is what you want to achieve eventually. But then you can't really get rid of the noise. Sir, uh, here in XK and X, like XK cap, like is XK cap the estimator of XK? Yes, XK cap is the estimate of XK. In fact, yeah. in fact, those equations that you have written are not uh, precisely right. Uh, both of them will be XK cap because both of them are actually estimates. Okay. And uh, if you actually go to the next slide, Rishab, I think you put the equations there. Uh, yes, yes. On the right, left hand side, you see XK is equal to XK add plus something something right yes, sir. that thing which is on the left is also actually xk plus one actually so this is the yes, okay what is happening maybe not this is the predict character step so probably not so what it is doing is as long as your measurements and i think some we were explaining this we we're talking about it notice that that z which you have there on the right hand side picture z equal to h of x plus v, right? So you're not measuring all the states when you're actually measuring from the sensors. So for example, if it's an accelerometer, it is measuring the accelerations and it is measuring the angular velocities. But it does not have an estimate of the linear velocities. It does not have an estimate of what the position is. So all those things are not measured, right? Every sensor only measures certain parts of that state vector or maybe some complex combination of those state vectors. But what we really want to understand is what is that underlying state vector we want to predict and get a good estimate of. So isn't IMU a collection of all these like together? Right? No, IMU is a collection of accelerometers and gyroscopes, but it has no position. So GPS is an independent aspect which has only the position. And that is what Vishwa is doing, that he is trying to combine GPS estimates together with the IMU estimates in a Kalman filter in order to get the full state vector, which means I not only know the position, I know the velocities, I know the accelerations, I know the angular velocities, I know the orientation. All those things he is using together. Okay. Okay. And that is where the point comes into the picture that if you had a perfect model, 
on the left hand side z would be equal to h times x so that the difference will be actually be z okay because z is not equal to h times x right we are trying to take that correction as a feedback and trying to update our x and see what is the difference what is the new possibility of this in order to minimize upcoming error so we want to kind of try to get the most optimal or most probable so what common filter is actually doing is more of statistics behind it along with dynamics so what it is trying to do is what sort of a uh, x will allow me to ensure that i have minimum uncertainty on x okay okay given that i have some uncertainty on the noise i have some uncertainty on the disturbance in the environment what is the position of x and given that position of x i have the minimum uncertainty around it. that is what it's trying to do it's trying to give you the most optimal solution and luckily mathematically it has been shown to be possible the mathematics behind it is not so easy okay this came about in the 1960s before that we did not have common physics so common was uh, one credited with this uh, amazing way to come back with it okay and the same idea actually applies even to control so whatever theory he has proposed for estimation of the state you can invert the problem in order to apply it to do control also you guys will learn more about this as time progresses i think it is a little too early to be able to fully appreciate the power of it but please understand that this is in essence trying to even though the name says it's a filter it's not really a filter alman filter is not just trying to give out take out noise it's trying to do much more it's trying to do actually fusion of different sensors to get the best optimal estimate of the state vector that you can possibly All right. Anything else? Any other queries, comments, or any other? Anybody else wants to ask a question? Sir. Yes, Anand. Sir, uh, you told about something about inversion of that to get uh, for control system. Mm hmm. So actually, how do I do that? You will you will learn about common filters in due time in our course. So don't worry about it. Have a have a little patience. <laughs> it is not so easy to just talk about it and be able to explain it. There is a lot of math behind it, which tells you how that happens. But we'll cover that. Okay. Yes. All right. Any other queries? Vishwa, so what should be our next plan of action? uh sir plan of action regarding this testing or in general data to this yeah in regard to this testing and trying to get that data together so that you can get your paper in place uh sure sir. so i think uh, once we have the test results so as i had proposed the like the uh, outline of the paper that we have uh, for walk we'll have uh, at least two three different parts mm -hmm. and for car also same and then cycle we can have one one part so i think if they do the uh, they'll do one walk path around that ground in atmatas uh, or the i i think ground is the name and then uh, car test your uh, if you can get one more path um, i can also do one path uh, like walking and cycling test in my campus so we'll have my suggestion would be vishwa that this mm. time since they have already learned from their previous experience of how to do the test more thoroughly mm. why mm. not we add more more uh, number of forms to the pool okay okay like these four people will only be testing it or how Oh. Yeah, let them test it, but let them also collect the phones, phones and uh, let Aditya and Vallabh also provide the phones. I think there are other people also mm -hmm. on campus. Who else is on campus? Is there anybody else? I think Shadab is also on campus, at least close by, so yes, he too can join. So I, I would suggest that you can increase the number of phones so that you can collect more, more data from them. 
sure sir sure uh, fine we can do that actually the only thing is we'll have to make sure that uh, one is that uh, if there are multiple phones limited systems running ross so we'll have to make sure that uh, yeah that that is something i'll make sure then then i think we can do that yes i i think you can also do one way one can be over usb protocol and one can be over wi-fi yeah yeah that is also possible so each laptop can basically connect to two phones then, right yeah yeah that and i'll have to make sure the topic names are different so that they don't overlap each other correct so, correct yeah. so it will take a little bit of a planning to do the experiment but i think it is yes. worth the effort so that you can get a good amount of vari variation of phones and be able to do yes sir uh, uh, like uh, already received data isn't it like uh, like can we you can infer it from the, the phone sensors are not that accurate right? so we do need other sensors as well oh, definitely so oh, definitely we do need a gps sensor but uh, the point being that uh, we still want to check with respect to his application how well it is performing and you see one of the things which i did expect and uh, probably which you guys can try is you know, you have now understood the path that we have taken right okay so each of the each of the four phones has a record of what are the gps coordinates that it has followed now you exactly know the gps of the path on google maps right so if you take a difference between them okay so if i am taking a difference between the your path and the reference path then what i should be getting is the so called noise isn't it yes if i plot a histogram of that noise what do i get i get a how much uncertain your sensor is is it plus or minus 5 meters is it plus or minus 2 meters or is it plus or minus 1 meter is it estimate which you can measure right this would be a measurement which will be depending on when you are moving at some speed you can we perform the same test while keeping it stationary and see how much it jumps around that will tell you an estimate when i am at zero speed how much is my answer will be surprised actually that at zero speed the answer is Okay. so these are the things which you should think about i i mean we did the test but what we are really interested is in quantifying the uncertainty of those points which we are not able to do right now right because in some cases the phone did not collect enough information for us to do the correction so the idea of doing this exercise is to see how good it is or how much is the variation from one phone to the other how much is the change in path how much is the deviation in path if the deviation is path is 20 meters i wouldn't be too worried if this the deviation is of the order of 15 to 20 meters that means that i can't use the parameter so it clearly makes a difference or at least it gives me an idea of what combination of gps sensors on one phone and an imu on the other phone might i be able to use together in order to make my job done so it will give me a good amount of information on how to proceed forward with it and it will also help vishwa in trying to see whether his application runs successfully on different platforms and yet it is running exactly fine so that is proof of concept that it works on multiple platforms in both senses it is kind of useful in that way Okay. So right. uh, just one query, like you said, we could take uh, the path from Google Maps and then, I mean, the coordinates from Google Maps and then compare it with our GPS, like what the app is doing. Mm -hmm. But I think it will be the same, no? Because it's ultimately using the same GPS module in the phone to capture it. So no, no. It, what, what, what I would suggest is you can do one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so let us say you got the triangle, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. so and then you are you are trying to understand from the triangle how far away they are yes right that is what i really want to understand that is the uncertainty quantification or more so as what is that cross track error so that that cross track error between the fuse data and the gps data right 
that cross track error what i would prefer is uh, you individually compare it between the gps data so let us say that you are taking the gps data from all of them mm -hmm. okay you have a time history of the gps mm -hmm. you take a average over the people okay okay so that will be the so called estimate of the mean value yes okay and from that mean how much are they deviating got it okay that will tell me tell me how good the gps is when it is moving at certain speed okay okay right sure. if they actually follow vallabh's approach where all the phones mm -hmm. can be put in one box mm -hmm. and then they are just walking with the box then there is no relative movement between the phones yes right in that case you should be able to precisely get what is the uncertainty quantification on gps on each of the devices yes yes yeah and i think that is worth including in your paper so different vendors how much is the uncertainty in each of them got yes so that would be one way then after fusion how much is the estimate is is it becoming better or is it becoming worse we should see it become better actually yes right that would be the idea so these are the things which we can investigate if we have that data yeah sure okay all right anything else anything else on any other topic Nothing else. So let me stop recording in that case.